What does Georgiana say that I have done? Jane, I will not have you take that tone with me. I do not like questioners. There is something truly forbidding in a child taking up her elders in that manner. Now be seated somewhere, and until you can speak pleasantly, remain silent. Little wretch. John, come along. She is not worth your notice. Say your prayers, Jane Eyre. For if you don't, something wicked will come down the chimney and fetch you away. you, little rat, skulking behind the curtain. What do you want? Say what do you want, Master Reed. You? You are not my master. Show the book. Pick it up. You have no business to take our books. You are a dependent. Mama says you have no money. You ought to beg not live here with a gentleman's children and eat our food and wear clothes at Mama's expense. Now give me my book. Your book? Yes, my book. They are all mine. The whole house belongs to me. Or will do in a few years. You are never to touch my books again. Mama is sending you away to school. What school? Lowood School for Wicked Girls. Prepare yourself for something very dreadful, Jane Eyre. That'll teach you to rummage my bookshelves. I don't believe you. 
You will. They are coming today to fetch you away. There you are. This is the child about whom I wrote you, Mr. Brocklehurst. What is your name? Jane Eyre, sir. Well, Jane Eyre. And are you a good child? Do you say your prayers night and morning? Yes, sir. Do you read your Bible? Sometimes. With pleasure? Are you fond of it? I like Revelations and Daniel and Job. And the Psalms. I hope you like them. No, sir. No? Shocking. Yes. Jane has many faults of character and disposition, Mr. Brocklehurst. Should she be admitted into Lowood School, I should be glad if the teachers were instructed to keep a strict eye on her. And above all, to guard against her worst fault, the tendency to deceit. She shall be watched. She should be made useful to be kept humble. And as for vacations, she will, with your permission, spend them always at Lowood. It shall be as you say. There is nothing so sad as the sight of a naughty child, especially a naughty little girl. Do you know where children dwell who don't obey their elders well? Whose feet are swift to falsehoods tell? They go to the devil down in hell. Do you know where young ones go? Wayward disposition show whose seeds of wickedness do sow. They go to the devil down below. Fire and brimstone wait for those whose hearts are wicked. Fear and tremble. Piety alone will save your soul. If you do not listen well, all your vile intentions quell. Oh, what a tragic tale we'll tell. You'll go to the devil down in hell. If she were a pretty little thing with a pretty disposition, one would almost want to pity her position. But you must admit there's not the slightest hint of anything to soothe the noble feelings of my truly pious Is hell. Can you tell me that? A pit full of fire. And should you like to fall into that pit and to be burning there forever? No, sir. Then what must you do to avoid it? I must keep in good health and not die. <laughs> you see her nature, Mr. Brocklehurst. Be assured, Mrs. Reed that this wicked spirit shall be rooted out. Be warned, Miss Eyre, that deceit is not tolerated at Lowood School. I am not deceitful. If I were, I would say that I love you. I despise you most of anyone in the world. 
Do you think I can live without one bit of affection or kindness? People think you are good, but you are cruel and hard-hearted. My Uncle Reed is in heaven and can see all you say and do. He knows how you hate me and wish me dead. I am glad you are sending me away, for I hate to live here. Get out of my house. A liar. This I learned from her benefactress, from the pious and charitable lady who adopted her in her orphan state, but alas was obliged to separate her from her own young ones, fearful lest her vicious example should contaminate their purity. And so I warn you be on your guard against Jane Eyre. Shun her example, avoid her company. Let no one speak to her and let her stand on that stool for the rest of the day. <laughs> Miss Temple, contrary to my clear instructions, I see that a lunch of bread and cheese has twice been served out to the girls. How is this? I ordered it done, sir. The porridge was burnt, and I couldn't let Miss Temple, these children must learn to accept hunger, cold, and poverty. When you put bread and cheese into their mouths, you may indeed feed their vile bodies, but you little think how you starve their immortal souls. this for you. You should eat something. Why do you stay with a girl whom everyone believes to be a liar? Everyone? If he had treated you as a favorite, many would have despised you indeed. You must not worry yourself about Mr. Brocklehurst. Eat a little, if you can. I'm Helen. Helen Burns. I'm Jane. But then, Mr. Brocklehurst has already introduced me. Oh, you must wish to leave here. Why? I came here to get an education. But he is so cruel. Mr. Brocklehurst is not well liked here, but he does pay for our food and clothes. Does that give him the right to humiliate and abuse us? The Bible bids us return good for evil. But if people are always kind and obedient to those who are cruel and unjust, the wicked would have it all their own way and would grow worse and worse. When we are struck out without reason, we should strike back again, very hard. So hard as to teach the person who struck us never to do it again. Goodness, Jane. <coughs> but you are passionate. You must learn to forgive. 
You must love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you. Then I should love Mrs. Reed, which I cannot do, and I should bless her son John, which is impossible. I hope you will feel differently some day. Would you not be happier if you could forget her severity to you? Life seems too short to be nursing animosity or registering wrongs. Look, it is only Miss Temple. I came on purpose to find you, Jane Eyre. I see you have met Helen, who should be resting. Yes, ma'am, though I don't know why she stays with me when everyone despises me. I don't think anyone despises you. Many, I'm sure, pity you. How can they pity me after what Mr. Brocklehurst said? It does not matter if all the world hates you and believes you wicked, if your own conscience approves you. Come, I want you in my room. Helen, you may come too. Thanks. Miss Temple. Never mind Miss Scatcherd. I'll see to this. I'll speak to her. Oh, my dear Helen, you should not be wandering about in your condition. This is what comes of hunger and cold. Shall I bring your tea up now, miss? Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, and can you place cups for the young ladies as well? Yes, miss. Tonight you are my guest, and I must treat you as such. Have you coughed much today, Helen? Not quite so much, ma'am. And the pain in your chest? It is a little better. And you, Miss Eyre, is it all over? Have you cried your grief away? I am afraid I shall never do that. Why? Because I have been wrongly accused, and everyone will now think me wicked. We shall think you what you prove yourself to be, my child. Act as a good girl, and you shall satisfy me. Oh, can you not bring a little more bread and butter? There is not enough for three. No, ma'am. Miss Arden says she sent up the usual quantity. Oh, very well. We must make due. Fortunately, I have it in my power to supply deficiencies for this once. I'm sorry there is not more. I meant to give you some to take with you. But as there is so little toast, you must have it now. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Miss Temple. Oh, my dears, you must envy other girls with happier lives. You've known much hardship. I dare say you've known little else. But it has not been in vain. It has brought you here, and here you have been blessed. Blessed with intelligence and a chance for an education. And that is the greatest gift of all. Oh, gracious me, you should be in bed. God bless you, my children.
Then are you awake? Is it you, Jane? Why are you come here? I came to see you, Helen. Miss Temple says you are very ill, and I couldn't sleep until I had seen to you. You came to say goodbye then. You are just in time, probably. Are you going somewhere, Helen? Are you going home? Will they send for you? I am going to my last home, my final home. No. No, Helen. You mustn't leave me. Be at peace, dear Jane. And when you hear that I am dead, you must not grieve. There is nothing to grieve about. My mind is at rest. Please shine down. 
And the little ones will certainly miss you. Oh, I'm sure they will get along just fine. On to a new situation, new adventures. Eight years you have been with us. I hardly know what to say. You seem as much a part of Lowood as the windows or the walls. There is much that I will miss about my life here, and we shall miss you. I shall miss you. And I you. Thank you. For what, my dear? For so many kindnesses. And for loving me when I thought no one ever could. I must get back. God be with you, Jane Eyre. Miss Jane Eyre, who advertised in the Yorkshire Herald of last Thursday, is in a position to give satisfactory references as to competency and character. A situation can be offered to her. There is but one pupil, a small girl, under, 30, under the age of 10, with a salary of 30 pounds per annum. Miss Eyre is requested to send address, references, and all particulars to Mrs. Fairfax at Thornfield Hall. A leaf falls from a tree in a golden hall and is carried by the west wind. A drop of rain falls from a clouded sky, from the mountain to the river to the sea, and the journey on, never knowing where the road will lead or where the wind will blow. So they carry on, letting go. Dear. Mrs. Fairfax, I suppose. Yes, you are right. Welcome to Thornfield. Come, let me help you with that. Oh, I beg you would not trouble yourself. Oh, it is no trouble. I dare say your own hands are almost numb with cold. John, John, would you take Miss Eyre's things to her room? Oh, and ask Leah to make a little hot negus and cut a sandwich or two. Here are the keys to the storeroom. I've had John lay a fire in your room so you can warm yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax tonight? Miss Fairfax? Oh, you mean Varens. Varens is the name of your pupil. 
Indeed? Then she's not your daughter. No, I have no family. I am so glad you are come. It will be nice living here now with a companion. Little Adele Varens came just this autumn and now you are here. I shall be quite gay. Oh, but listen to me going on. How do you like Thornfield, my dear? I like it very much. If only Mr. Rochester would take it in mind to reside here permanently. Mr. Rochester? Who is Mr. Rochester? Why, the owner of Thornfield, of course. Did you not know his name was Rochester? I thought Thornfield Hall belonged to you. Well, to me? Bless you, child, what an idea. I am only the housekeeper, the manager. <laughs> and the little girl, my pupil? Oh, she is Mr. Rochester's ward. A wild little thing she is, too, and why she is not in bed at this hour, I can't imagine. Sophie! Et dans mon institutrice? Mais oui, je viens juste d'arriver. Je suis très contente de faire ta connaissance. Do you understand her? Oh, yes. She speaks French better than Mr. Rochester. What a mercy. Adele, this is Miss Jane Eyre. She is going to teach you and make you a clever woman someday. Jane Eyre, uh, bah, I cannot say it. Les noms anglais ne sont pas jolis. Who have a tattoo avant de venir en Angleterre? <clears throat> Mrs. Delfax is only English. Oh, I do beg your pardon. I was asking Adele where she lived before coming to England. Oh. I live with Mama in Perry, but she has gone to the Holy Virgin now. She taught me to dance and to sing. Shall I sing for you now? Uh, uh, perhaps <coughs> tomorrow. It is long past your bedtime. Miss Eyre has certainly had a long day. Sophie, Adele, say good night to Miss Eyre. <coughs> good night. I am glad you are come. Precocious child. I think you have come just in time, but I'll not keep you up late. Let's get you to your room. You've been traveling all day. You must be tired from your journey. I've had the room next to mine prepared for you. It's only a small apartment, but I thought you would like it better than one of the large front chambers. <laughs> what was that? What? Did you hear that strange laugh? Oh, oh yes, that must be Grace Poole. She sews in one of the rooms upstairs. Leah's sometimes with her. They are frequently noisy together. Grace! Grace! Uh, too much noise, Grace. Remember directions. Come. Here we are. I hope you'll be comfortable. Say if there is anything you lack. It is everything I could wish, more than I am used to. Thank you, Mrs. Fairfax, for making me feel welcome. I shall try in every way to justify your confidence in me. Good night, Miss Eyre. I will journey on with an eye to the Sorry, sir, just a bit further. There we go. Now your boots, sir. If this is how you handle my horses, it's a wonder that can any of them walk, let alone run. I just can't make it out, sir. He's as fine a steed as ever I laid eyes on. It's not like him if you take my meaning, sir. I take your meaning. <clears throat> But any horse would have done the same if he were bewitched. Bewitched? Yes. By a strange fairy. A fairy? Yes, a fairy. A sorceress. She was lurking in the mist. A strange, unearthly creature. She cast a spell on my horse. What are you looking at? 
Go and fetch Mrs. Fairfax. Yes, sir. Mrs. Fairfax, the master wants you in the library straightway. His horse took a fall and he's got himself a sprain. The master? When did he arrive? Are you certain? Aye, if it's not him, he's the spitting image. Oh, goodness me. Uh, take care. He's in a temper. Got fairies in the mist, we have. Go and call Sophie down at once. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there you are, Mr. Eyre. Is there anything the matter? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Indeed, Mrs. Fairfax, I believe I have. Oh? Well, not a ghost exactly, but a very strange man indeed. Oh? Yes, I was just walking along Hay Lane on my way to post a letter when a rider came out of nowhere. I must have startled him, for his horse fell and he with it. He was injured. He used such language. Oh. <laughs> he was quite helpless to walk. He begged my assistance. What did you do? I gave it to him. I managed to help him back onto his horse and he rode away without a word. I don't even know his name. I think I do. I, I'm sorry? Never mind. You must go and change your frock quickly now. Quickly. Quickly. Frock? I Never mind, Mrs. Mrs. Fairfax. Show her in. Oh, dear. <sighs> so it is you. I beg your pardon, sir. This is Miss Eyre, sir. Yes, we've met. Ah! Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. If you just hold still a bit. This is Mr. Rochester. He is the master of Thornfield Hall. His horse went down in Hay Lane and he has been injured. Yes, I can see that. Be seated, Miss Eyre. No, don't. Don't draw the chair further off. Leave it exactly where I placed it. So, fairy, what were you doing all alone in that deserted lane, hmm? Were you waiting for your people? My people, sir? The little men in green, just waiting there in the twilight to do some mischief on a helpless traveller. The little men in green forsook England a hundred years ago, sir. <laughs> Frightened off by your kind, I'll wager. <sighs> so... You've been resident in my house three months? Yes, sir. Hmm. And you came from? From Lowood School. Ah, a charitable concern. How long were you there? Eight years, sir. Six as a pupil, two as a teacher. Eight years? You must be tenacious of life. Half that time would have done in most. And your parents? I have none, sir. We must have some kinsfolk, uncles, aunts. No. None that I know of. Well, then who recommended you to come here? I advertised, and Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement. You advertised? Yes, and I am daily thankful for the choice Providence led me to make. Miss Eyre has been an invaluable companion to me, and a kind and careful teacher to Adele. Don't trouble yourself to give her a character. I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse. I have her to thank for this sprain. Do you examine me, Miss Eyre? Do you think me handsome? No, sir. By my word, a singular reply. I beg your pardon, sir. I was too plain. Pray, what fault do you find with me? Does my forehead not please you? Mr. Rochester, allow me to disown my first answer. It was a blunder. And you shall answer for it. You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. It becomes you. You know more pretty than I am handsome. Mr. Rochester, oh. je suis heureuse de vous revoir. English again. Well, come on, Mr. Rochester. Did you bring a... Uh, Comme dit-on un cadeau? Ha! Ah, now we talk business, my little fillet. John! See if my horse carries anything for this genuine daughter of Paris. Mon cadeau, mon cadeau! Yes, yes. There is your cadeau. Now go and amuse yourself by disemboweling it elsewhere. And don't trouble me with the details of the anatomical process. Did you bring a present for Miss Eyre also? Did you expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? I hardly know, sir. I have little experience with them. Yes, uh, Mrs. Fairfax, would you see to the operation? Merci, Mr. Rochester.
You've taken great pains with Adele. She has no talents, and yet she has made much improvement. <laughs> Sir, now you have given me my cadeau. I'm obliged to you. Hmm? The gift teachers most crave, sir, praise of their pupil's progress. In a very few minutes, your pupil will burst back into this room, clad in her frilly pink frock and just beaming with that rapture. She's an exact copy of her mother. I'm not her father, Miss Eyre. She was left on my hands. Adele's mother was a French opera dancer. And uh, she charmed the English gold right out of my British pockets. I caught her one night with a handsome but brainless Viscount. I left a bullet in his arm, a purse in Celine's hand, and they left this French flower on my hands. You will perhaps think differently of your protege now. No, Adele is not answerable for her mother's faults, or yours. And now that I know that she has no one, that she's an orphan like me, I shall cling to her closer than before. I might have been very different, Miss Eyre. I might have been as good as you. I envy your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. How was your memory at 18? I was quite your equal at 18, but I was thrust onto a wrong track at one in 20. Fate has wronged me, Miss Eyre. Happiness denied me. But I have a right to get pleasure out of life, and I will get it, cost what it may. Then you will degenerate still more, sir. But I Mr. Rochester. Don't I look just like Mama? Precisely, and indeed just as artificial. Come, Adele. I will take her tonight, Mrs. Fairfax. Bien, cher Adele, c'est le petit, tout le petit chanteuse d'Escoli. Only wood and stone and mortar But oh, the tales these walls could tell Secrets of another life Of another man's hell No matter what I do it will not keep the silence Before too long you'll hear it Whisper in the darkness Forgotten faces at the window I know this house too gentle rays of morning, I mourn the man I might have been, cheated by the hand of fate, time and again. Despite my wasted youth, the future lies before me. Perhaps another chance to walk free in the sunlight. Or is this prison mine forever? Oh, this 
Now just a bit more on that side. Perfect. And there you are, lass. <laughs> will it really grow, Monsieur Jean? Aye, indeed it will. If you keep the roots warm and give it plenty of sunlight, you'll have wee yellow blossoms budding on your windowsill come spring. Monsieur Rasmus, now, look at my flower. What's this then? Is Adele misbehaving? Are we putting her to work in the gardens now? We were having a botany lesson. Thank you, John. Miss? I did it all myself. Monsieur Jean only helped me a little. And if I take very good care of it, I'll have little yellow bosoms in spring. <laughs> oh, no, no, it's blossoms. Blossoms, miss. She'll, she'll have blossoms. <laughs> I see. <laughs> miss Elle says I must learn to be beautiful inside. Like a flower waiting for spring. Did she now? And did they teach you that at Lowood, Miss Earl? Come, Adele. We must get you cleaned up. There is always hope of spring, sir. No matter how dark the night, the sun will rise? Exactly. That's very poetic, Miss Earl. Not at all. I believe it is human nature to hope. To look forward and not back. Otherwise, who of us could bear it? Who oh, indeed? Is there anything more, Mr. Rochester? No. no. Excuse me, sir. I had better see to Adele. Uh, do you grow flowers, Miss Eyre? When Providence sees fit to leave me in one place long enough, I do my best, sir. Sir, and you cannot too soon find out who and what it is. <coughs> Did you see anything when you opened your door? No, sir. Only the candlestick on the ground. And I heard a laugh. You've heard that laugh before? Yes, sir. There's a woman who sews here called Grace Poole. She laughs in that way. Just so. Grace Poole, you've guessed it. Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax? Mrs. Fairfax? <coughs> no! No, what can she do? <coughs> Say nothing of this. You are no talking fool, Jane. I will account for this state of affairs myself. <coughs> Return to your own room. I shall do very well on the library sofa tonight. Good night, then, sir. What are you? Are you quitting me already? And in that way? You said I might go, sir. 
But not without taking leave. Not without a word or two. You've saved my life, Jane. Snatched me from a, a horrible death. At least shake hands. You have saved my life. And I have immense pleasure in owing you so immense a debt. There is no debt, sir. I knew you would do me good at some time in some way. I knew that look in your eyes could not strike such delight in my heart for nothing. I am glad I happened to be awake. What, you, you will go? I am cold, sir. Oh, cold? Yes. Well then. Go then, Jane. Go. What a mercy, Master was not burnt in his bed. It's dangerous to keep a candle lit at night. Thank Providence, he had the presence of mind to think of the water in the basin. Indeed. Morning, Sophie. Good morning, John. Oh, <laughs> wee bit of excitement here. To be sure, although like this, it's a wonder the whole thing didn't come down on top of us. Well, uh, I'm glad you're all right. Me too. Uh, here. Ahem. <laughs> Grace Poole. Morning, miss. Good morning. Has anything happened here? Only the master fell asleep reading in his bed last night and left the candle lit, caught the curtains on fire. A strange affair. Did Mr. Rochester wake nobody? Did no one hear him move? The servants sleep so far off, miss. Not likely they would have heard anything. But your room's near the master's. Perhaps you may have heard a noise. In fact, I did. I'm certain I heard a strange laugh. Not likely the master would laugh, I should think, miss. <laughs> when he was in such grave danger. You must have been dreaming. I was not dreaming. You did not think of opening your door and looking out into the gallery? On the contrary, I bolted my door. Then you're not in the habit of bolting your door every night. I will from now on. It would be wise to do so. The servant's breakfast will soon be ready. Will you come down? Just put my pint of porter and a bit of pudding on a tray. I'll take it upstairs. Rats in the attic, steps in the hallway, locked her in the dark. You can't imagine what you will find one floor away. There's madness up the stairs, lunacy in extraordinaire. You look, but no one's there. Maybe not, then again. Dearie, there is madness up the stairs. Wits like a demon, face like a stone. Lights on the porch, but nobody's at home. Eyes in the window, glare in the night. You're, You're not alone. There's madness on the stairs. You're seeing extraordinaire. Oh, no, look, but no one's there. Maybe not. Then again, dearie, there. 
stairs, land me up the stairs. Wondering why they're talking in whispers, what is there to fear? Sure, your senses steady and true when all at once you hear. Rats in the belfry, rats in the attic, steps in the hallway, laughter in the dark. Directions. Dear me, there is madness up the stairs. Good morning, Mrs. Fairfax. Well, good morning, Miss Eyre. You are certainly up late. You look pale. Are you ill? Oh, no, on the contrary. I'm quite well. I never felt better. You should take some air. It is a fine day out, and you should enjoy it. It seems Mr. Rochester will have a favorable day for his journey. Journey? Oh, he set off the moment he had breakfasted. He has gone to the Lees. There is quite a party assembled there. I be believe he means to bring them all back to Thornfield. Do you expect him back tonight? Tonight, tomorrow, one never knows when he'll come. I've never known him to spend so much time at Thornfield as he has this season. And when these fine, fashionable people get together, they are in no hurry to separate. I believe Mr. Rochester is a general favorite. The ladies are very fond of him. <laughs> Any lady in particular? Miss Blanche Ingram. Blanche Ingram? Yes, so beautiful and accomplished. I saw them together at a Christmas party here some years since. She and Mr. Rochester sang a duet. Mr. Rochester, I was not aware he could sing. Oh, he has a fine voice and an excellent taste for music. And Miss Ingram played afterwards. I am no judge of music, but I heard Mr. Rochester say that her execution was remarkably good. Oh, indeed. Mrs. Fairfax, a message has just come from the Lees. Oh. You'd best go see to Adele. It's just as I said. Oh. The master writes and says he's on his way. He'll be here today. Possible. Make up every bed. We'll have a house full. What? He's bringing home enough to fill the hall. So sweep the floor and scrub the stairs and everywhere. The master's on his way. Leah, Sophie, see to the linens. Bessie, go and help Mrs. Poole with the draperies. Air the rooms and open all the windows. Make the crystal sparkle on the chandeliers. So we've got every chimney with a snap. Polish all the silver till it shines. Pull the drapes and, and dust, dust off every window. The master's on his way. John, see to the stables and have Robert go and fetch extra hands from the inn that mill cut. Clean out the stables and milk every cow. Saddle the horses, make ready now. Soak every fire and brush every flue. Sweep every mantle, so much ado. Music and flowers dancing for hours. What a show tonight. tonight will be. Chances, lines, 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 lines,
room and the extra cushions to Miss Eshton's room. Oh, and see that the sherry decanter is filled in the Colonel's room. It seems to be empty again. Oh. Mrs. Fairfax, I switched out all the water basins and brought down the extra chairs from the attic. Fine. Now, when Miss Blanche is out riding with the master, we must move her things into the large front chamber next to Miss Eshton's. Move? What's wrong with the room she's in? She felt a draft. A draft? Yes, Mum. Mrs. Fairfax. What? Uh, yes, what is it? Lady Ingram wonders when to expect tea and asks if she be moved to a different room. She complained that she was feeling a draft. A draft? Tell her to get another blanket. I'm all out of rooms. Yes, Mum. Oh, on second thought, have John move her things into Blanche's old room. Yes, Mum. A draft? The place is 150 years old. Of course there's a draft. I must say, Edward, you do not tell me that Thornfield boasted such splendid views. Yes, I suppose it does. It's a wonder you can bear to leave it as often as you do. Does that person want you? Yes, Jane, what is it? Miss Ingram, would you excuse me? Of course, Edward. I must ask a leave of absence. Why? To see a sick lady who has sent for me. What lady? Where? Mrs. Reed of Gateshead Hall in Devonshire. Reed of Gateshead. I knew a magistrate of that name. It is his widow, sir. What have you to do with her? Mrs. Reed is my aunt. I thought you had dear relations. None who would own me, sir. She cast me off as a child. And yet you want to see her? How long will you be gone? As short as time as possible, sir. Promise me only to stay a week. I cannot give my word when I might be obliged to break it. At all events, you will come back. Yes, sir, I will. I suppose you must have some money. I have given you no salary and you cannot travel without money. How much have you in the world, Jane? Five shillings, sir. <laughs> Five shillings. There's 50 pounds. But, sir, you owe me only fifteen. I have no change. I don't want change. You know that. Go on, take your wages, Jane. Right. Better not give you all now. You'll stay away three months. Ah, here's ten. Is that not plenty? Yes, sir, but now you owe me five. Come back for it then, Jane. I'm your banker for five pounds. Thank you, sir. Jane. Off with you. And remember, a week at most. Goodbye, then, sir. Aunt Reed. Who calls me aunt? Move closer. It is Jane. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. What did they do with her? It lowered. The, the fever broke out there. So many died. She did not die. I, I wish she had. 
A strange wish, Mrs. Reed. Why do you hate her so? I have had more trouble with that child than anyone would believe. My husband pitied it and used to nurse it and notice it as if it were his own, more indeed than he ever noticed his own at that age. There was something I wished to say. Where is, where is Jane Eyre? I am Jane Eyre. You sent for me. I am here. Oh, I have twice done you wrong, which I regret now. One was in breaking the promise to my husband to bring you up as my own child. The other, I must get it done. Eternity lies before me. Read it. Read it. <coughs> Madam, would you please have the goodness to send me the address of my niece, Jane Eyre, and to tell me how she is. It is my intention to write shortly and desire her to come to me at Madeira. Providence has blessed my endeavors, and as I am unmarried and childless, I wish to adopt her during my life and to bequeath to her at my death whatever I may have to leave. I am, madam, etc., etc. John Eyre, Madeira. It is dated three years ago. Why did I never hear of this? Because I disliked you, Jane. I could not forgive your conduct to me. I was a child then. Dear aunt, forgive me. I long to be reconciled to you. I tell you, I could not forget it. For you to be adopted by your uncle and placed in a state of ease and comfort was what I could not endure. I, I wrote to him and told him you were dead. Now, act as you please. <clears throat> Write and contradict me. Expose my falsehood. <clears throat> you were born, I think, to be my torment. <laughs> Dear aunt, think no more of all this. Be at peace. You have my full and free forgiveness. Thank you.
Hello. Is that Jane Eyre coming from Millcote on foot? Yes, yeah, just one of your tricks not to send for a carriage and come clattering over street and road like a common mortal. <laughs> so, Jane, you have returned to Thornfield after all. I gave you my word. I will go and tell Madame Dalfax that Miss L has returned. Trunt. Absent from me and forgetting me quite. You begged only a week and have been gone nearly four. And you said I was not to be trusted. Only three and it could not be helped. Mrs. Fairfax writes that you have lately been to London. Did she now? And did she tell you what I went to do? Yes, sir. Everyone knows of your wedding preparations. You must see the carriage, Jane, and tell me if you don't think it would suit Mrs. Rochester exactly. And won't she look like a queen, leaning back against those pulpit cushions? You know, Jane, I wish I was a trifle better looking to match her externally. Tell me, fairy, can't you give me a charm or something to make me a handsome man? It would be past the power of magic, sir. <laughs> her loving eye is all the charm needed, and as such, you have power beyond beauty. Pass, Janet. Go up home and stay a weary little wandering feet at a friend's threshold. Mr. Rochester. Yes, Jane. You have as good as informed me, sir, that you will shortly be married. Yes. What then? Then Adele ought to go to school, and I must seek another situation. And how do you propose to do that? I shall advertise. Oh, you shall walk up the pyramids of Egypt? At your peril you advertise. No, promise to trust this quest of a situation to me. Very well. Welcome home, Jane. Gentle breezes, the summer gone, with warm surrender, the autumn still, in quiet splendor, and when the leaves that trough forsaken at last descend. In slumber taken, leave bare the limb, unscreen and tender, and stands the tree in silence yonder, alone the willow, the winter frost is calm. The meadow cold and still waits beneath the snowfall through endless winter chill. But comes the spring into the meadow and shines the sun upon the willow, and once again in breezes sway, the branches green, as if to say, my friend, your winter's past and gone. In past years green 
And that, my dear Colonel, is how the game is played. And I'll be, if she didn't, you had better watch yourself with her, Rochester. <laughs> uh, Mr. Rochester, there is someone here to see you, sir. I'm Mr. Mason, all the way from Spanish Town, Jamaica. Mason? Yes, sir. He said you were not expecting him, but would not go until he had seen you. He was most insistent. Richard, why are you here? It's good to see you too, Edward. I'm sorry. You must be very tired. Mrs. Fairfax, put him in the lower guest rooms. Richard, wait for me there. I will come as soon as may be. As you can see, I have guests. It is good to see you. Chester, I thought you were not fond of children. Nor am I. Then where did you pick up that little doll? I did not pick her up. She was left on my hands. You should have sent her to school. I could not afford it. Why? I suppose you have a governess for her. You do pay her, of course. I would think it quite as expensive, more so, for you have them both to keep in addition. I had not considered the subject. <laughs> Men never do consider matters of economy. Blanche and I have had a dozen governesses, half of them detestable and the rest ridiculous. Were they not, Mama? Did you speak my own? Governesses? Oh, don't mention governesses. The very word makes me nervous. I have suffered a martyrdom from their incompetency and caprice. I thank heaven I am now done with them. Mrs. Ingram, I do believe there's a governess present. Tom P., I hope it may do her good. I noticed her and see in her all the faults of her class. And what are they, madam? <clears throat> Ask Blanche. She is nearer you than I. Where are you going? I am tired, sir. Stay. It is my particular wish you should stay, please. Let us have some more music. Oh, yes! Rochester, Blanche, you must, you must favor sing. us with a song. <gasps> you must sing together. Mm? <sighs> Certainly not. I, I have seen your daughter play at cards, madam, and soundly beat more capable opponents than I. I will certainly lose this contest, and believe I will save myself the embarrassment. Miss Ingram, I concede the game to you. Very well, then. <laughs>
Be composed, all of you. It is nothing. <clears throat> a servant is at a nightmare, that is all. Uh, now that it is quite late in any case, and I must have Mrs. Fairfax show you to your rooms. For until the house is quiet, he cannot be looked after. Gentlemen, have the goodness to set the ladies the example. To your rooms, please. Please. Good night. Good night. Jane, come with me. Richard! What in heaven's name? I tried to warn him, sir. I thought I could have done some good. Richard, what on earth possessed you? I told you to wait for me. She said the most dreadful things. I, I thought I could have done some good. Don't listen to her gibberish, Richard. And whatever you do, do not repeat it. She said the most dreadful things. <sighs> Jane, I need you. You must get him as silently as possible to the carriage house, and then tell John to go and fetch the doctor from Millcoat. Can you manage it by yourself? Of course, sir. You must not speak to him on any pretext. And Richard, it'll be at the peril of your life if you speak to her. Open your lips, agitate yourself, and I'll not be answerable for the consequences. Edward, let her be treated as tenderly as may be. I'd do my best. I have done, and will do it. Now go! Grace, open the door, Grace. Are you all right? Yes, sir. I tried to tell him, sir. I know, I know. Grace, go get yourself some rest. I will see to her tonight. Rats in the belfry, rats in the attic, steps in the hallway, laughter in the dark. You can't imagine what you will find one floor away. When are you going to come round? <laughs> Run away with me, Sophie. And live where? In the barn? And you beat all talking, all smooth and sly, and you covered in soot from head to toe. Oh, I only got three more chimneys after this one. I'm as fond of any of the master, but I must say, I was rather pleased to see him in the party off to London first thing this morning. It'll take a month to set this place to rights again. I reckon that's so. Only the master didn't go with them. He's locked up in his study. That's odd, that is. Mm. What's this? What have you done with your arm? I don't rightly know. Give it here. I swear I spend half my waking hours keeping you mended. What's that look? You don't really mind, do you? Ow! Oh. Give in, would you? I can't take much more of this. You've got to marry me, Sophie. Well, what would I want with the common stable land? Just look at you. But I love you, lass. All the way, right down to the middle. You know I do. Well, you're nothing much to look at. <laughs> and besides, what do you know about society and the way of things? I know enough. Pardon me, miss, I'm just a simple man. With sunburn on my face and weathered hands. No privilege in my lowly state, not much to offer a mate. But heart and soul, I'm yours, you know, so anxiously always Wondering if someday I'll say I do Hoping with all my heart that I'm there too For 
Whenever we two in love will be and oh what love you'll see Within the arms of just a simple man I'd do anything in the world for you, Sophie Well, you can start by having a good wash What would I want with such a simple man? Society ways you'll never understand With rumpled hair and tattooed shirts You're rather a sight to see The horses in the barn are your more likely company Happily though you go about your day Giving a helping hand along the way A kindly way and gentle word a girl can understand And make her glad for just a simple man Does that mean you will? I will You'll never regret this, Sophie, I can promise you that Wondering when if you say I, I do, do. I'll be good to you. Forever we two in love we will be, and all love will be within the arms of just a simple man. In love with just a simple man. Thornfield is a pleasant place in summer, is it not? I'm sorry, sir, I didn't see you. Yes, sir, yes, it is. And you have a regard for that foolish child Adele, and even for Ampledane Fairfax? Yes, sir, I have an affection for both. Pity? No sooner have you got settled in a place than a voice calls for you to rise and move on. Must I move on, sir? Yes, Jane, I believe indeed you must. I shall be ready when the order to march comes. It has come now. Then you are going to be married, sir. Exactly. Precisely. With your usual acuteness, you hit the nail straight on the head. Soon, sir. Very soon, my... Miss Eyre. Adele must go to school and you must get a new situation. Then I shall advertise directly. No. Lady Ingram has already told me of a situation that will suit. It is the education of five daughters of a family in Ireland. Ireland? Oh, you're like Ireland, Jane. Such warm-hearted people there. It is a long way off, sir. It is, to be sure. I am sorry to send my little friend on such weary travels. But surely a person of your sense would not object to the voyage. Not the voyage, but the distance. And the sea is a barrier. A barrier? From what, Jane? From England and from Thornfield. And from you, sir. Are you anything akin to me, Jane? Because I sometimes have a, a queer feeling, especially when you are near me. It is as if I had a string somewhere under my left ribs inextricably knotted to a similar string here. And should too much distance come between us, the cord of communion would snap and I should take to bleeding inwardly. I wish I had never been born and that I had never come to Thornfield. Because you are sorry to leave it? I grieve to leave Thornfield. I have lived a full life here. I have not been trampled on. I have not been petrified. I have been treated with respect and kindness. I have known you, Mr. Rochester, and it strikes me with anguish to think that I must be torn from you forever. I see the necessity of departure, and it is like looking upon the necessity of death. Where do you see the necessity? Where? In the shape of Miss Ingram, your bride. Bride? What bride? I have no bride. But 
that you will have. Yes, I will. I will. Then I must go. No, 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 you must stay, I swear it. Do you think I can stay to become nothing to you? A machine without feelings? Do you think that because I am small, obscure, plain and little, that I am soulless and heartless? Do you think wrong? I have as much soul as you and full as much heart. And if God had granted me with beauty or wealth, I would make it as hard for you to leave me as it is now for me to leave you. I speak to you not through convention or custom, but as if we had both passed beyond the grave and stood at God's feet, equal as we are. Yes, equal as we are. Well, let me go. Where, Jane? To Ireland? Yes, to Ireland. Be still, Jane. Don't struggle, sir. I'm a free human being with an independent will. And your will shall decide your destiny. I offer you my hand, my heart, and a share of all my possessions. You mock me. Come to my side, Jane. Let us understand one another. I can never again come to your side. I am torn away now and cannot return. It is only you I intend to marry. Your bride stands between us. My bride is here. Because my equal is here, and my likeness. Jane, will you marry me? Do you doubt me? Entirely. You have no faith in me? Not a whit. Little skeptic. What love have I for Miss Ingram? I wouldn't, I, I could not marry her. I think you know that. You, you, Jane, I entreat to accept me as a husband. Jane, I must have you for my own, entirely my own. Let me look at your face. Turn to the moonlight. Why? Because I want to read your countenance. Turn. Jane, you torture me. Accept me quickly. Say, Edward, I will marry you. Are you in earnest? Yes. Yes, I swear it. Then, sir, I will marry you. Make my happiness. I will make yours. I will. Chambers, dark and cold, were not beyond the reach of your embrace. But in all my childish dreams, could I have once imagined there was someone in this world who loved me as I am now?
We just go in. The weather changes. know what to say to you, Miss Eyre. Mr. Rochester has asked me to marry him. And you believe him? Have you accepted him? Yes. I could never have thought it. I am sorry, but you are so young and so little acquainted with men. I wish to put you on your guard. Why? Is it impossible that Mr. Rochester should have a sincere affection for me? No. I hope all will be right in the end, but believe me, you cannot be too careful. Gentlemen in his station are not accustomed to marry their governesses. John. Yes, sir. Is the luggage brought down? Aye, they're bringing it down straight away. And Mr. Wood? Where is Mr. Wood? He's here, sir. And the carriage? The horses are harnessing. It must be ready the moment the ceremony is done. The boxes and luggage strapped on and the coachman in his seat. Yes, sir. Jane? Jane, are you ready? Lingerer, my brain is on fire with impatience, and yet you tarry so, so long. You look like a lily. I require and charge you both, as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be revealed, that if either of you know of any impediment why you may not lawfully be joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. Wilt thou, Edward, Fairfax, Rochester, have this woman to thy wedded wife, to have... The wedding cannot go on. I declare the existence of an impediment. Proceed. I cannot. What is the nature of the impediment? The existence of a previous marriage. Mr. Rochester has a wife now living. She was recently seen at Thornfield Hall. Impossible. I am an old resident of this neighborhood. I know of no Mrs. Rochester of Thornfield. I have a witness to the fact. Then produce him or be silent. Mr. Mason, would you have the goodness to step forward? It is true. Mason! Courage, Mason. Mr. Rochester was married to Bertha Antoinette Mason in Spanish Town, Jamaica some 15 years since. I am a brother. I'm sorry, Edward. Close your book, clergyman. There will be no wedding today. Fate has outmaneuvered me. Or oh, Providence checked me. You say you've never heard of Mrs. Rochester? No. I took care that none should ever hear of her. Though I dare say you have heard gossip of the 
mysterious lunatic kept at Thornfield. She is my wife. The girl knew nothing of this. She thought all was fair and legal and never dreamt that she was to be trapped in a feigned union with a defrauded wretch. Come. Come, all of you, and meet my wife. You know this place, Mason. She bit and stabbed you here. Grace. How is your charge today? Uh, well enough. A little warning, if you please, sir. A few moments. Grace, I don't believe these gentlemen have had the honor of meeting my wife. Take care, sir. She has no knife now, I suppose. One never knows what she has. She is so cunning. This is Mrs. Rochester. Bertha Mason is mad, as was her mother before her. My father and my brother knew of her madness and her fortune, and plotted against me for their own purposes. She was indeed beautiful, and I was young and impetuous. The family secret was kept from me until after the wedding. She cannot help being mad. Oh, if madness were all. We had better leave her. Brother's madness was aggravated by a salacious and drunken nature. For four years, I lived with her until I nearly took my own life. Mr. Rochester. Condemn me if you will, clergyman. But that was already in hell. What more could the devil do to me? And this is what I wished to have. This young girl who stands so grave and quiet. Compare these clear eyes with those. Judge me if you dare, priest. But remember, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall also be judged. No! Off with you, all of you. I must shut up my prize! Just to be done. 
Jane. 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 There, not too quickly. That's better. Are you well enough to speak? Where do you come from? Diana? What is this? Sinjin found her on the doorstep. She's half starved and very ill. Can you tell us your name? Sinjin. My name is Jane. Jane Elliot. Can we send for anyone you know? What account can you give of yourself? You are too inquisitive, Sinjin. I have nothing to tell. Indeed. Yet if I know nothing about you, I cannot help you. And you need help, do you not? Yes. Where do you live? The name of the place and the people with whom I lived is my secret. Which, in my opinion, you have a right to keep. She clearly requires rest, not interrogation. Have you never been married? Sinjin! Why, she cannot be above 17 or 18 years old. I am near 19, but I am not married, no. I wish to find work. What kind of work? Have you any education? Of course she does. Look at her clothes. I left Lowood School nearly a year ago to become a private governess. But I am willing to accept anything. A governess? Yes. By your hands, I see that you are not used to servant's work. I am not afraid of honest labor. I will do any honorable work to keep myself. Sinjin. Sinjin, what about your school? Yes, she has been a private governess. She is certainly qualified to teach these poor things. May I remind you, dear sisters, that we know nothing about her. May I remind you, dear brother, that Mary and I must leave to resume our post at the end of the month. I don't see you have another choice. Why not accept the blessing that Providence has been kind enough to leave on your doorstep? We are but a poor country parish. Our aid must be of the humblest sort. You may think it degrading. Sinjin, she has already said she will do anything she can do. And she has no choice. She's forced to put up with such crusty people as you. When we came to this parish two years ago... Mary, please. <clears throat> When we came to this parish two years ago, it had no school. I established one for boys. I mean to open a second for girls. A two-room cottage is provided and a meager salary. That is all. Mr. Rivers, I accept with all my heart. But you comprehend me. It is a village school. Uh, farmers' daughters, cottagers' children, 
Sewing, reading, writing, and ciphering will be all you will have to teach. I understand. And what will you do with all your accomplishments? They will keep until they are needed. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Well, if all the children of the parish are well and truly saved, we must get you out of these wet things and into a warm bed. Very well done, ladies. You will please leave your alphabets for tomorrow. That will be all for today. Mr. Rivers, please come in. I cannot stay. I have only brought you a little parcel my sisters have sent to you. Thank you. So, have you found your first few months' work to be harder than you expected? Oh, no, on the contrary. I think I shall get on with my scholars very well. Uh, perhaps your accommodations, your cottage, your furniture have disappointed you. My cottage is clean and weatherproof and my furniture more than sufficient. Remember, four months ago I had nothing. Now I have a home and acquaintances. I wonder at the generosity of, the go of God and the goodness of my friends. But do you feel the solitude and oppression? I have hardly had a chance to enjoy a sense of tranquility, much less grow impatient or lonely. What or who you left before you came to us, I do not know. But I counsel you firmly to resist any temptation to look back. You must pursue your present career, steadily, for some months at least. It is what I mean to do. Is there anything more, Mr. Rivers? Yes, there is, in fact. Uh, sit, please. I have heard a strange tale which may interest you. Some twenty years ago, a poor man of no consequence fell in love with a rich man's daughter. They married and her family and acquaintances immediately disowned her. The couple both died shortly thereafter, leaving a daughter who was then reared by an aunt, a Mrs. Reed of Gateshead Hall. You startled. Did you hear a noise? Mrs. Reed kept the orphan ten years at the end of which time she was transferred to a place you know well, Lowood School. First as pupil, then as teacher like yourself. Really, Miss Elliot, it strikes me that there are so many parallel points in her history and yours. She left Lowood to become a governess to the ward of a Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rivers. I can guess your feelings, but restrain them, please. I have nearly finished. Hear me to the end. Of Mr. Rochester's character, I know nothing, except that he tried to marry his governess, who at the very altar discovered that he had a wife yet alive, though a lunatic. The governess left Thornfield Hall in the night. The country has been scoured far and wide, but every attempt to find her has been in vain, yet it is a matter of great urgency that she be found. Advertisements have been put in all the papers. I myself have received a letter from one Mr. Briggs, a solicitor in London. Since you know so much, what of Mr. Rochester? Where is he? Is he well? I am ignorant to all concerning him. You should rather ask the name of the governess. Did no one go to Thornfield Hall then? Did no one see Mr. Rochester? The inquiries were not answered by Mr. Rochester, but a lady, Alice Fairfax. Edward. He must have been a very bad man. You don't know him. Don't pronounce an opinion upon him. <laughs> very well. In any case, my thoughts are occupied with other than him. Since you will not ask the name of the governess, I will tell you. Mr. Briggs wrote me of a Jane Eyre. I knew a Jane Elliot. I confess I had my suspicions that Elliot was not your name, but only yesterday were they resolved into certainty. Do you own the name then and renounce the alias? Yes, yes. But can Mr. Briggs tell me nothing of Mr. Rochester? I should think not. You are quite forgetting the essential points to pursue trifles. You do not inquire what Mr. Briggs wanted with you. Well, what did he want? 
merely to tell you that your uncle, John, heir of Madeira, is dead, that he has left you all his property, and that you are now rich. What? Yes, quite an heiress. Twenty thousand pounds. Astonishing. I wonder that my uncle did not return my correspondence. Correspondence? You knew him, then? I knew of him. My Aunt Reed told me that he had once tried to find me. Where are you going? To write to your sisters and tell them of their good fortune. Their good fortune? Explain. Explain? What is there to explain? You cannot fail to see that 20,000 pounds divided equally between the four of us would leave 5,000 each. 5,000 each? Jane, you are acting on first impulses. You must take time to consider such a matter. I need no time. My mind is quite made up. Jane! Jane, you're looking so thin. Sinjin must be working you to the bone. We'll have to see to that. I can hardly comprehend it. What a strange and wonderful change of fate is this. Be what it may, fate or providence, I keep expecting to wake and find that I have been dreaming. Oh, it is real enough. Sinjin. No. Might we stay at the Moor House? But of course we shall stay. No, sister. I mean to say that we might add to it, as we have now been blessed to add to our family. We might do as we like. God has brought you to us, Jane. Now that I am without any living relative, you shall call me sister and share in all that providence has showered upon me. With a brother and sisters, I shall consider myself truly rich. <laughs> you are yet very excited by this news, Jane. I should have waited more time before telling you all. You two must be weary from your travels. Oh, it was only five really? miles. Let's take our things upstairs. I'll set the tea. Jane, stay. I wish to speak with you, please. Jane, I have made you my study these last few months. I have watched you, tested you. I thought early on perhaps you were meant for God's work, and that may be why you sent to me, uh, to us. Now, I am certain of it. You know that I sail for India in six weeks' time. Jane, God and nature intended you for a missionary's wife. A missionary's wife you must, you shall be. I claim you. I claim you for myself and for God's service. What? Come with me to India, as my helpmeet and fellow laborer. Sinjin, have some mercy. I'm not fit for it. Indeed. Who is fit for this work who thinks himself worthy? Sinjin, I think of you as a brother, nothing more. Nor do I believe that you can think of me in any way but a sister. I am sure you do not love me in that way. Jane, you were formed for labor, not for love. <laughs> that may be true. But if I am not formed for love, I am certainly not formed for marriage. I do not want to marry. I never shall marry. Jane, I offer you a high and noble calling. Only as my wife can you embark upon it. How can I, a man not yet thirty, take with me a girl of nineteen, unless she be my wife? In a far-off place in a heathen land, there is work enough for a Christian man. But should he venture into the unknown, all alone, through toil and strife, have by his side the deference of a humble bride to help and labor with him all his days. Tis the life of a missionary wife. Oh, well said, Sinjin. What girl could resist such an offer? You talk as though she were a plow horse. Look at her. She'll be squashed flat by an elephant in the streets of Calcutta. In scorching heat, in burning sand, forsaken in a forsaken land, a thousand miles from anyone she knows, only woes. In poverty, in rank disease, starvation, oh, did he mention these? The hardship and the sorrow you will know, tis the life of a missionary wife. If I were really qualified for the task, would not my own heart be the first to inform me? And what does your heart say? My heart is mute. Then I shall speak for it. Give your life to God. No holding back, no sacrifice too great. Deny yourself to 
save a heathen soul from hell. Satan, please, do not take our sister from us. As providence has blessed us now, brought our sister home somehow, to wander Carnal comforts. You cannot give half an offering. It is in God's behalf that I speak to you now, Jane. Give your life to God. There is no no holding back, back, no sacrifice to grace. She's finally made your choice. The time has come, but remember thee. Piety alone will save your soul. Come with me to India, as my wife. Undoubtedly enough of love would follow to render the union right, even in your eyes. Enough of love. And for the rest, though you have a man's vigorous brain, you have a woman's heart. I have a woman's heart, but not where you are concerned. Sinjin, I would not. I could not marry you. It would kill me. Kill you? Those words are unfeminine and untrue. If you will not give your heart to God, it little matters where else it turns. I will give my heart to God. You apparently do not want it. I scarcely expected to hear such an expression from you. I know where your heart turns and to what it clings. The interest you cherish is lawless and unconsecrated. Long since you ought to have crushed it. You should blush to allude to it. You think of Mr. Rochester. You have not told me all. You know more of Mr. Rochester than you have disclosed. Tell me what you know. Only this. On the very night you left, the lunatic of a wife set fire to the house. She perished in the blaze. There is nothing left of Thornfield. And Mr. Rochester, is he dead? Tell me, is he dead? Jane. Jane. Jane? I must know what has become of him. Will you take my arm, sir? It looks like we may get a bit of rain. You better come in now. Let me alone, John. I will stay a little longer. Yes, sir. I'll go and have Sophie start the tea. Come. Excuse me. Yes, miss. Can I help you with something? Sophie? Yes? You say? Is it really you, Miss? Come at this late hour to this lonely place. How are you, Sophie? John, look, it's Miss Eyre. Come a visit in. Well, so it is, so it is. How do you do, Miss? Very well, thank you, John. Oh, let me take your things. Be seated, if you please, Miss. I have come to see Mr. Rochester. The innkeeper at Milkett told me that he's been living in the servant's cottage since the fire. Is he here? Yes, Miss, but... I don't think he'll see you, poor Mr. Edward. What do you mean? Then you don't know, miss. Know what? About Mr. Rochester, Miss Eyre. He's quite broken down, he is, that's a fact. It was all his own courage, you might say, has left him this way. Left him what way? 
The fire, miss. He wouldn't leave till everyone was out. The whole place was up in flames. That's when he saw her, Mrs. Rochester, as no one knew about. She was on the roof screaming and carrying on like the very devil. He tried to reach her, but she jumped. By the time he reached the great staircase, there was a great crash. He was pulled out from under the ruins, alive but terrible hurt. He's blind, Miss Eyre. Stone blind. Where is he? Miss, he's grown quite savage since he left. Yes, the hour is late. Have you come to take me back? I have indeed, sir. John? Sophie? Is that you? Sophie's in the kitchen. Who is this? Answer me. Speak again. The evening grows cool. Will you not come in and warm yourself, sir? Who is it? Who speaks? What delusion has come over me? What sweet madness! No delusion, no madness. My very fingers, my small, slight fingers. If so, there must be more of her. Jane, my own Jane. Yes. You have come back. I have. You have come back to me. You are altogether real. I conscientiously believe so, sir. I doubt my senses. Can this be? Am I hideous, Jane? Very, sir. You always were, you know. Where the path may go, the morning sun will rise. 